If you would like to show more support for the podcast, you can do that by checking out the show's sponsor, Custom Reptile Habitats. There is an affiliate link in both the YouTube description and the show notes. If you do make a purchase through that link, a commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. The other way you can show support to the podcast is through the Patreon account. For as little as 75 cents per episode, you will automatically be added to the Discord server so you can communicate and chat with other like-minded keepers. If you do bump yourself up to the $5 a month tier, you'll have early access to the episodes and the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests. Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, I'm speaking with Benjamin Fabian, who is the human behind the Instagram account, Dragantha's Dragons. Benjamin is one of the most thorough and intelligent people I've had on the podcast, which you'll learn shortly once we get into this episode. He works with the genus Phrenosoma, which is the horned lizards. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with horned lizards as they have this interesting dietary requirement for ants. They must keep, must eat ants even in captivity. And so we discuss the sort of the complexity of working with a such a specialized species, but We discuss why Benjamin works with them, how he got into them, how he replicates nature and their their natural history and their climate in captivity. But really, this is just an episode that lays out a a perfect template for if you want to be a gold standing member uh, of the herpeticulture community, because everything that Benjamin does and talks about in this episode will make you realize that's how much potential someone in the private sector has. He knows so much about these animals. He's been working with them for more than two decades and he's still young. So it's incredible. I can't imagine how much he will learn in the future. So it, again, we discuss this genus, the, the intricacies of caring for them in captivity. Of course, we delve deep into how he accomplishes feeding them ants in captivity, collecting them, in, collecting ants in the wild and raising them in captivity and how you actually feed ants to a lizard without them escaping into the room. It is a brilliant, fascinating conversation, and I know you'll enjoy it. Let's jump into it. Benjamin, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited. I mean, I, I love to talk to people who have this very you know, specific focus when it comes to herpeticulture, and you're sort of taking it to another level just due to the <laughs> species you're working with and, and some of the, complex, the complexities, especially with the diet, that uh, anybody who's seen the thumbnail for this episode or the title, talking about horned lizards... N- most people know that there's an ant requirement. So we're going to talk all about that, but that scares a lot of people. And it just goes to show how dedicated you are to to the craft. L- let's rewind the clock a little bit, give people some foundation of where, where you're coming from as far as the herpeticulture world goes. Did, have you been keeping reptiles for a long time? Um, I started at the age of 10. Before that, um, in my area, I was always around and then catching lizards. But um, after I catched my first lizard, I realized, okay, they, they drop off the tail. So I was more the observer. Um, in my area, reptile keeping was not as common. So everyone had fish. So my at the age of six, I started with keeping fish. I was pretty um, fast to catch up and had an eye for some species i want to keep so two years in i was already breeding them um i was more specializing in um, south american dwarf cichlids like blue rams epistogramma some small catfish um, species and was trading them at the local pet store but they became pretty saturated over time so they suggested me to go to a just like a flu market for for hobby breeders Mm. it's more like a gymnasium in the the local school where you go in put in your table so i started selling my fish there pretty quickly because it was not as common to have um, um, offspring from those species and was roaming around Um, there were some people having bearded dragons some of ball pythons ball constrictors and a lot of people with um, tarantulas Mm. And also a stand with books and magazines. And then on the cover of one magazine, I was spotting the horned lizard. And it was nothing like I have seen before and immediately catched my interest. But then I was already hit with the first truck. Um, reptile keeping in the in the late 90s and in the early 2000s were, were wild. Mm-hmm. It's like somebody had placed the fear of everything from everything outside into the people's minds. So I was already told you can keep them and they need and acid and stuff like that. And the guy uh, besides the table shouting, yeah, but they get every, uh, imported every year and in dozens. And I was like, OK, I know I was not getting far in terms of information from those two. So I was <laughs> I was getting the magazine. And, and a couple of books and, and immediately start researching. And 
the summer after I got my first horned lizards and it stuck until today. Wow. Okay. That is actually not the answer that I was expecting. I, I was expecting, you know, the more typical thing and then getting into more common species and then finding horned lizards along the way. But that's actually where you started. Yeah. Wow. In my opinion, it, it doesn't really matter if you start with a, with a more specialized species or a, a bearded dragon of some sorts, because every first animal you keep is, is a learning experience. And in some sorts, every animal is specialized in, in the environment it lives. It's, it's, it's evolution. Mm. Yeah, so yeah that's for a me, great point. Yeah. So for me, it was... Um, it was not not a way really to get a substitute because I was already interested in that species and that drove my my learning um, my learning experience and 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 stems the foundation to what I've become right now with the species. So, what year was it when you first acquired your your first one? Um, it was rough. Um, they were in pretty bad shape. But um, over a long run, I was already having um, some experience with them from from reading alone. So I gave them water, and um, unlike everyone telling me everything from outside is bad, um, to <laughs> they telling that to a kid who already dumped stuff from outside for years in his fish tanks, like mm. all the cones leaf litter would. Um, I was getting ants from outside. They recovered pretty quickly. In terms of light, I never had really a problem. I already had metal halides and incandescent bulbs from uh, my um, um, fish tanks. The, uh, um, the one thing I had to acquire was a mercury vapor bulb for a little bit of UVB. In the summer, I placed them outside. So the, the basics were already there. And I think fish keeping helped me to understand um, that it's more an animal you have to observe than handle. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember what year it was when when you you first acquired your first one? Uh, yeah, ninety nine. Oh, that was ninety. Okay, wow. Yeah. So you've been doing this for <laughs> twenty five years. <laughs> yeah, almost twenty five years. Yeah. And, and during that twenty five year span, have you only kept horned lizards, or have you dabbled in other species as well? I had to keep other species because um, when I was turning eighteen, after my first education, I was starting at a pet store. So I was um, more or less responsible for fish and and seawater, freshwater, and, and the pond section. But they kept uh, or they recognized that I um, already kept on lizards. So they drove me a little bit more in that direction. And we had a lot of rescues. So I was um, getting supported to um, keep them there and then also educate customers and stuff like that and already made exams. In, in Europe, you can make exams like um, it's called Paragraph 11. It's from the government and natural um, conversation. You can say um, uh, you can say that some sorts. So you have a basic knowledge that enables you to keep and sell different kinds of species. Mm. And over the years, I kept the most common, and also some I I had interest in because of. Um, because um, the problem was I already had um, the knowledge of the horned lizards, but not from the predators. So I already had um, I had interest in king snakes and and some predators that were roaming around around that. Gotcha. But yeah, all sorts of animals back then. It, it is. I mean, you seem so young to so to say that you have twenty five <laughs> years of experience working with a one you know genre of animals is really wild. You know that's crazy. Yeah, it's. It's cool, but also on the other hand, you get um, looked down a lot. So when when Facebook and stuff like that came and, and I um, was entering groups, I was suddenly surrounded by people way older than me telling me everything I do is wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah. Can I ask how old you are? Um, I'm 34. Oh, you're 34. Okay. So yeah, you, I'm, you, I'm you, turning you look... 35. Huh? Yeah, yeah. You look... I, I thought you were maybe a little bit younger than me. I'm 32, but uh, <laughs> so that makes sense. So you would have been, you know, in... A ten or eleven, or maybe twelve, when you first got into them initially. Mm, it was ten, eleven. 10, so, 10, 11. so that's some sorts, yeah. So I'm I'm curious about this because you know there's there's a big difference between seeing an interesting animal on the cover of a magazine mm. and then going through that research phase and then actually acquiring the animal. I, I imagine that most people would be turned, you know, 
a horned lizard looks incredible, but then you start researching, you realize, okay, there's a big ant requirement. That's going to be a massive turnoff to people. I'm curious to, to know why that wasn't a turnoff for you. And then I also would love to know what it was like when you first actually laid your eyes on the real thing. Was that a pretty exciting experience? Oh yeah, it was like a dream came true. Um, I was always fascinated with, with dragons per se um, from video games, from from Pokemon at that time. So they were the closest to an actual dragon besides the um, trivial name of the bearded dragon. They were mm. actually like a dragon. So um, I was already a year in my research because I, I had to wait until the next batch were imported. And then I was asking around in, in local zoos and stuff like that. And a month after I got them, I catch some um, conversation about a guy in Switzerland already keeping and breeding horned lizards since the 70s. And mm -hmm. nobody told me. <laughs> and he released a book in 1998. I was getting that book in, in just 2000, which is, I will always have it by my side. Wow. So it was from Bernd Bauer. And it's already my third one. It's, it's falling apart. And um, then some more information got out to me. So I was already able to to connect the dots I already had in mind with scientific evidence. So I was I, I knew I was on the, on a good path, and it was a real help because in the in the third year, I um I had them. I was actually start breeding them um, regularly. The first two years were more like an experiment. I had some stuff wrong with rumation. Rumation was too warm. Incubation was wrong. Um. So that was a big help at that time. Mm. And, and then the ants piece, just even the research mm. phase before you acquired them, that yeah. didn't scare you. For, how come? Because I was surrounded by ants. <laughs> it was... Simple. Yeah, it was so simple. Um, everyone told me stuff from outside is bad, but those animals live in environments way harsher than I have at home. So I was already, I was going out to our garden because I knew we had no pollution or stuff like that. Um, getting ants, six months later, I had my first eggs. It was pretty easy for me. Amazing. So for those who are totally unfamiliar mm -hmm. with the genus, can we run through just some of the basics that, you know, as a bird's eye view of this genus? So there are about 20 recognized species. You can find them in North and Central America. Um, the range is from the edge of Canada over the southwest down to Mexico, Baja California, and then a tip uh, population on the tip of Guatemala. Um, they are in a, var a, var a variety of different habitats, um, mostly around ants where ant populations are. They occupy um, areas with loose or sandy soils, but sometimes also dry riverbed, lush forests. We have shrublands, grasslands, and um, also volcanic areas. So they are adapted to our environment pretty much in every way. But all of the species um, prefer to have a similar body shape. So evolution catched pretty early on them, and they um, developed um as surrounding ants in the environment mm. and, and how how large are they because they're, they're fairly small if i if i'm knowing correctly oh they are big ones um, oh they are big oh there are big ones okay oh they are big ones the Phrynosoma asio is the mexican great horn lizard um they get from head to vent 12 centimeters mm. the wow. other um between that we have also a varieties of, of different sizes so between three centimeters head to vent to about 12 centimeters, we have everything between them. Gotcha. But, and their actual sort of body plan does look somewhat similar, I guess, across all species. Like you said, evolution yeah. kind of kicked in pretty early with them, but there's a size difference and I'm sure some color, you know, some variations mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Um, typically, um, the color variation is um, determined by the surroundings they have. They are pretty good at camouflage. Um, they are adapted at all sorts of environments. Their back is all um, also made um, like sandpaper. So after a shed, they cover themselves with the substrate and blend in more 
mm. um, into an environment. They also have a row or some species have two rows of fringe, uh, fringe scales around the sides. So they eliminate every shadow. If they press themselves down to the substrate, you can't see them. That's amazing. That's and that's so what awesome. people will see either if they're watching this on Spotify or YouTube or you know going to your Instagram page after mm-hmm the most eye catching thing about your page is how beautiful you've, you know, cr- recreated those environments. So we, I, I really want to talk about that as well, but you know, that's one of the fascinating things about keeping a species like this is getting to replicate some of that in captivity. Uh, how many species have you, or do you work with or have you worked with over the years? Um, I'm on the eight now. Okay. Um, I've right now at the moment, I have only two species I work with because of limited space. But over the years, I have kept and bred um, seven, and now I'm with the Texas horned lizard, and I'm in in the eight. And are they fairly? As you said, they have quite a large geographic range, mm-hmm. and I'm sure that's species specific. So, are do you actually cater their care differently based off the species, or are you kind of following a similar template across all species? Depending on the um, on on the density of population, I know where they were imported because of the regulations in in the USA. So um, adjacent areas are more or less the same. But I um, go after a baseline. I go into the specific care of every animal. Mexican species, you can keep them much more like a frog or um, a bearded dragon. They are more tropical. Um, desert species need a little bit more arid, loose soil, um, a little bit lower in humidity and ever average humidity, but also with sorts of microclimates. And depending on the species, I incorporate different sorts of, of structures and, and brushes. For example, Texas hunt lizard has a dedicated stripe on its back, which helps simulate a dried grass. And then I just put in dry grass so they can camouflage a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. I, let's talk a little bit about the, just doing research for this because mm-hmm. this obviously this is something that you're quite good at is doing research on a species that doesn't have a ton of information. And like, where do you start? How do you do it properly? How do you make sure that you're acquiring the right information? I think it's important to um, also research the environment. So... I start with research, and and it doesn't matter for me if I have this, if I had a species of horned lizard or I'm I'm getting a new one. I always start over with my research so I can catch up. Um, I usually go over the um, density of population. Where is the highest density? Because that tells me okay, there's most likely the most suitable conditions, and then I start with researching the environment first. I look at um, envi- environmental studies. I look at geographical studies, agriculture. I look plants. Um, then I look at the soil and the composition of that. I look at predators and also um, what kind of ants or other invertebrates are there, and then. At the last point, then I research the animal itself. Mm. So you start with this sort of foundation of yeah. the the earth yeah. that it's being surrounded by, whether that's predators, prey, yeah. and climate. Absolutely, because that's what evolution does. We have the environment with most likely all its predators and and and, and the food source, and the animal has to adapt to it. So for me, it is a logical conclusion to um, look in the environment first, and then. Um, seek out what's the what's the animal's needs Mm. something like population density are you just getting that from academic papers written on this the the genus okay yeah um i read about 50 to 100 papers um (laughs) (laughs) in a couple of months so i'm pretty um i'm pretty picky on on information i do my own research um also look at all all um, different kinds of topics. Um, it's not just about an environment. I look at botanical studies, geographical studies. It's um, you can you can uh, compare a study made from a, di- a geologist with a study made on the environment by a biolog- uh, biologist. There's two different kinds of people with two different mindsets. The one looks after the animal first. The other looks after the stones and the gravel and the substrate. Mm-hmm. It's much more like you have different light sources which are good in one thing and you combine them. That's basically what I do. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. And the thing is, is when you're, you're at the end of the day, you're doing research for husbandry for an animal, but you almost have to completely get rid of the, once you've identified the area, you have to delete the animal from your brain yeah. almost. And that, because that really hampers what you're going to use as resources. If you're trying to attach those resources to that specific animal. Yeah, exactly. I want to recreate the environment without the factors of a predator or um, without the factors of, um, without the bad factors, let's say so, let's say so. And then I put the animal in. It's also like a habit I, I picked up from fish keeping. I first, I first uh, set up the environment, looked at everything is right, and then I introduced the animal. Mm. And as I said, it's so clear that you do that because the enclosures are set up so well and that the animals look like it does really look like a piece of nature. So why don't we discuss just a little bit of the husbandry and, and mm-hmm. we'll save the ants for later. Cause I think that's a quite a speed bump to cover, but oh, yeah. let's, let's just discuss the basics of, you know, enclosure size and, and uh, lighting and whatnot. So I'm most specialized in the, in the desert dwelling species or more arid, you can say. So for the middle size species, like um, the most common is the desert horn lizard in captivity. And after that, it's the Phrygnosoma solari, the regal horn lizard. I usually go with a standard four by two by two. And then I um, first I do the substrate. I incorporate a drainage layer so that excess water can drain down. Um, I usually try to build up rock formations, um, but on old bricks so the uh, animals can't undermine them. They dig a lot and then I start to mix my substrate so in the in in the um in the layers um over the over the drainage I usually go with a mix of topsoil organic topsoil of course sand clay and peat moss so the moisture gets retained but um um after a given threshold it gets sucked up by the drainage and over that I incorporate um something like uh, clays uh, and and clay sand mixture um that lets pass through um the moisture but also keeps the um also keeps the um the environment uh, sort of dry so the animals can dig in mm-hmm. and on top of that i usually put in gravel and what matches the markings of my animals so i also study the local range and try to incorporate that for my um, desert horn lizards, it's more a little bit of leaf litter and, and fine gravel. Or I like to use the Exoterra product, um, the stone desert, because it's a pretty good foundation. Mm-hmm. From that, I try to source plants from the native range. If I can't um, ha- if I can find them, I try to raise them myself or find a substitute. And it's more or less like a like a composition of different materials to match the actual environment. Gotcha. And, and for the drainage layer, what are you using? Mm-hmm. And then are you separating it with a screen or because they are quite mm-hmm. they, they like to dig, do you kind of leave the screen out? I leave the screen out, but I use a mixture of liquor balls and okay. um, volcanic stone or um, lava gravel because um, the liquor stone is good at releasing a little bit of the moisture, the lava gravel holds it a little bit more. So I want to have the functionality of both. Mm. And, and uh, eventually, I imagine that it, it mixes with the actual like finer yeah. substrate. Yeah, of course. That's why I usually go with a, lo- a little bit bigger of the um, of the lava rock. The problem, and that's something I had in fish tanks um, as well, is if you mix different um, gravel sorts or sand they try to compact and get hard and that's what i want to a little bit to to um, counteract right. um i also incorporate a, a hose a silicone hose over the whole length of the enclosure so i can um, put in water from outside to uh, rehydrate the deeper levels of substrate so that plants can access them and it also can um can help with rehydrate the soil itself in the mm. upper layers. Okay, that's interesting. So you just have like a tube that goes underneath into the drainage layer yeah. so you can water basically the base layer without having to soak the topsoil. Exactly. Mm. That's do, something I've developed over the years. Do you mist at all on, on top as well? Yeah. Oh, you do? Okay. Uh, once a week I mist because I have live plants in it and it's also a natural uh, way of rehydrating for um, for the lizards itself. They lick it from the stones, from the gravel, uh, from the gravel from all of the decorations, even from the walls of the enclosure. 
So rain harvesting for them is a central functionality in, in the wild. So I usually spray them once a week. Will they use a water dish at all? Um, they will also. Um, my Texas hunt lizards, they, uh, they jump in the water dish. And one day I came from, from work and looked <laughs> and looked at all three of them in a water dish looking at me. <laughs> I was like, okay, I get robbed right now. It, it's a hilarious picture. <laughs> That's awesome. And then what about lighting? Uh, you know, desert species, I'm sure there's uh, you have a lot running on top. Oh, they need a lot of light. There's a lot of hormone, uh, hormone-based um, um, functions they need to um, with the light. I usually go in as much light as I can. I have metal halides, LEDs, and all sorts of different light sources to match natural spectrum as far um, as close as I can. The problem with the standard four by two by two is, is they get easily overheated. Right. So that's in summer, I have to get rid of the LED or put in a, um, um, a low wattage um, metal halide. That's why I also try to uh, build new enclosures. I also have to uh, put in some ventilation um, with PC fans and something like that, or have to take out the, the glass and put in half grass, um, glass so I have a little bit more airflow. Right. Yeah, that is a challenge with a, with a species that's going to need a lot of light, even if it's not a heat, oh, yeah. specific heat light or lamp, it's going to still put off a ton of heat. Yeah, that's a problem. And I think most standard enclosures are not suitable for um, for species like that. You need to have a fairly deep substrate layers. I usually go with 10 to 20 centimeters at minimum. But realistically, you need to have 30 to 40 centimeters, which matches the actual studies from the desert. Right. And then uh, as far as temp- actual, like the temperatures that you're aiming for, just maybe ambient during the day and, and, a, and a warm spot, what do you what do you shoot for? Actual ambient between 30 and 32. Okay. Um, if we go not for power density, but for surface measurements, I go with usually between 30, um, 48 and 50 degrees on the sunspot where all um, lamps match and on the shadier side between 28 and 30 is okay because the animals um, with a proper setup the animals can re- thermoregulate through the through the substrate or go in the shade or yeah, yeah. Uh, use the microclimates i offer and do, do you worry about measuring humidity at all or do you just do the one missed a week and just go from there i do the one missed a week um because that also matches with the um, with the weather data and with the deep substrate layer i usually have a good hydration if uh in in during the hot months i give them um directly water through a small pipette or syringe because that's when with with the standard um, size enclosures you get a little bit more problems and in germany it can get really hot i'm in the south uh, south part of germany um on the border of of french uh on on the french border so it gets really hot mm. they have to counteract a little bit yeah yeah that makes sense so so up until that point it like the base care for these guys is relatively straightforward for i think most people mm-hmm. would agree that you know it, as just kind of similar to any arid species but we <laughs> take a steep left turn when we get into the the diet so oh, yeah so let's talk about their their requirements and i, I, I i'd love to know the theories behind why the ants are something they need or if there if there's an answer to that i'd be curious to know or what what are some of the suggestions that people say that are the reason for that and then we'll get into how you're actually accomplishing this there's a easy answer and and a more elaborate one the easy answer would be okay ants are more available even Mm -hmm. under the harshest conditions um the more elaborate is that they evolved around ants there's this persisting um, urban legend that they would eat their ants to um, regulate their stomach acidity to counteract um, parasites or they need the acidity to um, regulate all sorts of internal organs something like that but that's completely wrong we know from research that um, a lot of ants in the native range all um, don't produce any um, acid it's more about other contents of the ant, um, like ants are rich in fiber, calcium, protein. They have no carbohydrates. They contain about 584 amino acids, 
and albumin, which is in blood serum responsible for transporting fatty acids and calcium and also binding toxins. The problem um, with ants is that um, because they have no carbohydrates and um, horned lizards don't need a long period of rest like crocodilians after a large meal, um, they need to eat a lot more. So they developed an stomach that's uh, that's about 13% larger compared to other lizards. Interesting, w- which is really a fascinating adap- adaptation for a, a reptile considering that yeah. typically the, they're used to a much slower metabolism and they can get away with eating a lot less. And I, obviously there have been people in the past who have acquired these and then attempted to not feed them ants. What happens when, that, when, when they go about that? They die. They simply die. You can think of it um, if they are not ha- if they are not having a proper diet, they will get all sorts of sicknesses. Um, you can also think of uh, think of a horn lizard like a diabetical species. They need ants to also pr- uh, um, process other food because of some sorts of the ants. Um, the problem with common feeder insects is that they have a widespread thin chitinous layer and carbohydrates. And the calcium phosphor balance is way off. So if they are fed a continuous diet with the wrong, with most likely mealworms or um, or crickets, they will get um, kidney failure, liver failure, and they die. And um, they can't process the, the fatty acids or the chitin. Right. It, it you're is really forcing them. Yeah, yeah, you're just forcing them to do the to, to eat a yeah. diet that they're actually not adapted to, and it, it's so fascinating because so many reptile species are quite general generalists when it comes to what they're able to eat. You know, yeah. snakes and and even lizards have a pretty wide prey variety that they can typically consume. So to find something that has, uh, assumably they're eating lots of different species of ants, but it's still within yeah. one band of of insect that they can eat. Yeah, they eat most likely um, harvester ants because it's the most common in North America, but they also have um, some sorts of species of, of different ants. The invasive um, fire ants, they only eat the queens if offered them, but um, it's also um, a problem with um, conservation over there because the fire ant also eats harvester ants, despite having the harvester ants, despite having um, one of the most potent toxins or venoms in, in the animal kingdom. Right. So, how do the does the does the venom affect the as they ingest these harvester ants? Does that affect the lizards at all? That's so genius. Um, we know um, from research that, um, of course, harvester ants have one of the most potent venoms in toxicology. The median lethal dose or LD fifty value is uh, something you can use to determine the toxicity of a given substance. Um, for harvester ants, the venom is so. Um, so well researched, we know for, um, we know that the LD50 factor is about one zero uh, point one two milligrams on a kilogram, which translates that twelve stings can kill a two kilogram wool red. Wow, wow, that's really potent. I I have um, a small colony of harvester ants. The pain is unbearable. I got stung by one. It's it's nothing I want to repeat in 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 terms of experience. But horned lizards have a blood factor in, in serum that neutralizes um, the venom completely. And in terms of comparison of the red, they are about 1,500 times more resistant to the venom than the red. Wow. Because presumably they get bit all the time if they're. You know, oh, they get animal- stung and bit all the time. But they also have, in, in terms of swallowing, it's um, just one neutralization from outside. But overexposure will, of course, kill them. But from from the terms of eating, they developed such a unique way of disabling um, the ant's defensive mechanism itself. They have a sticky tongue, much like chameleons. And when they swallow the ant, they cover it in, in mucus. So they cover it, disable all the defensive mechanisms, and then gain the soluble um, nutrients and components of the abdomen of the ant, the thick chitinous layer, they can process or, or it's no needed to process, they throw it out. So that's how um, in comparison, they need to about need to eat about 200 ants to get on the same level as um, 
for example, the colored lizard eating two locusts or crickets. I'd like to take a quick break to thank today's show sponsor, Tamascus Limited. Many of you are probably already familiar with Tamascus as the founder has been on the podcast before. That's Thomas Griffiths. Last summer, we did a podcast called The Fundamentals of Lighting. And if you are any way confused by lighting, you must go listen to that episode because we break it down in very simplistic terms. Tamascus is an independent animal and husbandry consultant as well as a research and development consultant. Thomas works behind the scenes to help improve lighting technology for everything from just a keeper like you and I all the way up to really high level zoos. Thomas has an incredible amount of experience from testing lighting technology all the way to actually making sure it's implemented properly in the field, which makes him uniquely positioned to give lighting advice for animals in captivity. He works with all taxa, ranging from small reptiles and amphibians all the way up to large mammals. He is trusted by zoos, vets, and the world's leading manufacturers. This allows him to offer professional and friendly advice tailored specifically to your needs, knowledge, and budget. Tamascus also covers continued professional development and training for those of you who work in a pet store, a vet clinic, or a zoo environment, and all advice given is protected by insurance. Thomas is available for both in-person and virtual consultations. If you're looking for more information on Tamascus, make sure you head to tamascus.com. That is T-O-M-A-S-K-A-S.com. Wow. So it's a lot more work. So how, how do they acquire yeah. them in, in the wild? Are they just sitting next to anthills and digging through them? Yeah, exactly. You can find um, horned lizards most likely around or in the surroundings of, of anthills. That's also a way where, um, that's also um, um, in terms of evolution, that's why they um, developed su- such um, secretive behaviors. Um, because ants are way farther out in terms of their um in terms of of exposure in in the heat than other invertebrates so they had to uh, find ways to um, sit on an anthill and literally lick those ants out without getting caught by predators Mm. that's why they they developed those um, tank-like bodies and be able to uh, blend in with the surroundings. So, um, and they are more resistant to heat than other lizards, for example. So they can have uh, longer exposure levels in the sun while eating their food. That's incredible. I mean, when you think about the evolutionary process, it's, obviously it's a chicken versus the egg situation, but yeah. you have this animal that's sort of committing to eating ants and the rest of its body is adapting to make that continue to happen you know, in, yep. in, in, in response to incredibly hot heat and predator or yeah, predators that could just come pluck them off the anthill, they develop all these weapons to allow them to continue to gorge 200 ants a day. Yeah. The whole lizard is adapted. It's, it's almost like they are over-engineered. Yeah. Even if they get spotted, they have a lots, lots more of, um, defensive mechanisms. Um, some sorts of horned lizards can shoot blood out of their eyes. Mm. Which is uh, most like, uh, which is mostly a uh, defense mechanism uh, mechanism against uh, canine predators. They can puff up themselves and make them bigger. They can also make them extremely flat and 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 play dead. And if they get swallowed, they even have the horns. Right. So the um, they were found um, road roadrunners were dead with a horned lizard in the in the throat, pierced by the horns. Wow. So yeah, they're not an appetizing meal for most predators. Absolutely not. They are so adapted in the rhyme and it's incredible. That, that is really amazing. So, you know, you had mentioned that they actually won't eat fire ants, which are invasive and are slowly mm-hmm. taking over the harvester ants. So when you first started working with them, you said you were surrounded by ants outside, but I guess it's not really a slam dunk that they're going to eat the ants that are native to you. D- d- yeah. Was it... was was it pretty much they took to them right away or did you have to work on introducing that specific ant species to them as a diet? Um, they usually take all ants I offer them, but I also have to make research on the ants itself because I have to find um, some sorts of different ants um, that match the um, nutrients, the nutrient level for the harvester ants or what, what their evolutionary needs is. Um, the problem I had at first is when I introduced ants to them, I just put them in a small bowl and they were scattering around um, this, um, the enclosure so they were pretty scared at first. That's when I started to develop um, those ant feeders. Um, first I put in a small uh, um, flower pot. They usually have this um, this hole for drainage on, on the underside and put that over the ants so not all ants um, get out immediately that's 
when I was first trying to replicate an anthill from the wild, I was also try um, try to introduce um, something like the yellow meadow ant, which is pretty common around here. It's an ant that lives mostly most uh, most of the time un under under the surface, so it's more um, more adapted to um, more more. Um, it's more calm. So it was gotcha. not scurrying around and, and scaring the ants. So the first time introducing ants to the actual horned lizard, it was tough, but I made it through. Yeah, I can only imagine. Uh, if for me, when I feed crickets, I just get annoyed at how easy they can be to escape. And yeah. they, but they're so large and they're easy to find, and you know they make a noise, so you go see them. But I can only imagine what it would be like to like throw a bunch of ants into an enclosure and just watch them infest the place. Yeah, my wife don't likes it. Um, <laughs> last night we found uh, one of the ants at uh, crawling at uh, at the uh, um, ceiling, and she was giving me the looks. Yeah. Also, um, why I would need to make new enclosures <laughs> to keep them because, ant proof. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I have to keep them ant proof. Um, also, ants that are not in the enclosure not get eaten, which throws off my whole uh, my whole diet plan. Right. So, so you you have. It sounds like you have a, a group of ants that you're working with and culturing on your own. And then do you still wild collect your ants? Yeah. And even if you aren't, yeah. so can you tell us that process? And then we'll get into the ones that you're culturing. How, how do you go out and, it, it seems pretty obvious, you probably just scoop them up, but is there a tactic that you use? Um, yeah, I have different tactics on different ants. Um, most ants that live un underneath, I can just take a shovel and, and bucket and sort them out. Um, then there are ants that are more um, aggressive um, in terms of intro, um, intervening in, in the daily cycle. So I have um, make, made uh, a vacuum cleaner. It's, it's a hand cleaner with, um, with a small jar on it and, and, and a valve that can sub, suck up the ants and then um, introduce them into the enclosure, which also is, um, is preferable to me because I don't have to um, um, collect the the earth itself right and destroy so, the ant barrel yeah yeah that way yeah you probably feel a little bit less guilty you can just yeah. uh, suck them up and but if if they have to eat so many ants a day how are you are you constantly is this like a daily thing that you have to go outside and and yeah. collect ants or you do it every day i um, right now i do it every day because it's still a little bit cold outside and my animals woke up earlier than expected in summer i can usually go once a week but horn lizards are a species you have to dedicate and yourself to it because you're most of the time in the summer you're out collecting ants. <laughs> and if you, for example, have other species beside that, you're also, for example, a monitor. You have also um, a play with the monitor to have it um, mentally stable. It's something I never can keep besides of horn lizards, but I am also not interested in keeping monitors. Mm. Yeah, but that that is the commitment level. It is something yeah, that this exactly. is only something a reptile keeper would do. By the way, it's just commit to like a forever ant collection. Um, during um, New Year's Eve, they woke up because we had we had a warm spell. So I was um, out there, minus ten degrees, scooping up ants fifty centimeters under under the surf uh, surface. Wow! So I, I, I assume by your home, there's like a place that you regularly go to. I have multiple places because I won't over. I, um, I don't want to over collect because it's something I need to do for at least uh, 50, 60 years in terms of how long I actually live. <laughs> so I have different places of um, where I can uh, scoop ants out, and then I usually go to one place a year. Or if we are on a road trip, I collect ants there too. And I also have a friend um, which. Uh, runs uh, an end store here in Germany, so he can also give me some um, here and there from his big leaf cutter colonies, mm. and I also breed them myself. But so, it's, yeah, when you it's, bring the wild caught ones inside, are those go going immediately into enclosures to be fed, or do you put them in con cont containers and keep them for a while before feeding them? Um, I usually go out with with a couple of containers. Um, there are the uh, those droso um, drosophila. Um, um, fruit fly containers with the lid and the mesh. I usually use them because sometimes I have way um, smaller ants um, than others, and they can immediately get out if I have a, a larger spread mesh. 
So I really, uh, usually have them and keep them in the crawl space I have on the side. Um, so they're a little bit cooler and, and hold out longer. Gotcha. So then let's talk about the ones that you actually breed and culture yourself. Mm-hmm. What species is that and how do you, how do, you do that? Um, I have a couple of ant farms um, and most like um, the most I breed are the um, European harvester ant because I want to give them the opportunity, uh, opportunity to have a similar diet as in the wild. And I also have um, the red harvester ant, Pogonomium exbarbatus, but those colonies are um, two years in and they are really slow in, in producing uh, workers. They, uh, they eventually get really big. But those first three or four years are I'm um, just keeping and breeding them. And on occasions or when I'm not able to go out, I um, usually pick up from those farms and introduce them to my home lizard. Gotcha. And then you you'd already mentioned sort of simulating an anthill in the enclosure, but the ant yeah. feeder now seems like you've kind of nailed it. Can you describe that to people who maybe who are just listening, what that how that functions and how the lizards respond to it? I usually strive for a minimal interaction setup, which I think is the best way to keep reptiles. Um, I also don't like uh, the enclosures. The, um, the animals can always see me and, and are distracted. So my way over the years, um, I had different prototypes and now we have our own place and I can do as I will. I um, put in the enclosures and stuff in the place and drill the hole from outside, feeding, um, um, attaching a container which I um, which I smeared over the lid with talcum powder so the ants can get out, and are forcing to get over the hose inside into my actual ant feeder, which I used for years. In this container, the only way out is over the um, over the stick, and that's simulating the ant hill, and their response to it is um, exceptional because I was able through that ant feeder. And they're not seeing me actually putting the food in it to um, see natural behavior. They are way calmer, way more um, occupied. And oh, yeah. it's something I am, um, from the video, I already got responses from hepatologists who actually live in that area and, and say what I do is nearly that what they see in the wild. But even then, I'm not satisfied. <laughs> I want to make it way more like the actual desert. How, how, do you have an idea of how you might do that? Oh yeah, I actually planned out. Um, we are right now fixing the roof, so um, all of the rooms are um, in in renovation. But after that, I built new enclosures that are more like tubs, which are um, one square meter and then seventy centimeters um, height, with um, with a lid on top and also. Um, an open, more an open style outdoor, outdoor enclosure or turtle tub. You see it. I um, actually got on that idea from Philip Leeds, mm. um, Eretz only. Yeah. He uses that tubs and um, it seems to work really fine. So I was kind of thinking like I do that as well, which enables me to put in way more light because I don't have a closed box that's overheating. And then also it can give my animals more space, a much deeper substrate layer. And then I try to go with an absolutely no interaction setup besides retrieving eggs and um, spot cleaning. Wow. So then you would have basically ants being fed into that enclosure all the yeah. time? From outside, I, have a, um, I will introduce a, a wealth. I can open and close from outside, put in ants actually put in the ant farm on the enclosure or different styles of, of containers. I can put ant from outside so that animals don't have to see me. I want, actually want to have the same expression from the enclosures, um, like the um, pictures I see from the wild. I also yeah. want my animals to have more of the wild response and not being used to me giving them food. I want them more wild because I think if I if I trigger more wild um, or more natural behavior, uh, it also ha- it also will help with breeding that initial response to reproduce because of a predatory um, intruder. Yeah. So I, I want to talk about I want to talk about the breeding process as well, but I also mm-hmm. want to talk about why. L- l- let's just talk about the the process of breeding first, and then I really want to dig into you know what's motivating you to to keep. The, as wild as possible and reproduce these. So as far as, you know, you've been breeding them for two decades now, what are some things that 
that are keys in order to make this successful? Um, usually for the most species, it determines if you can breed them the year before. Um, the brumation has to be on, on top. They have to need, they need those periods of rest because, um, during that time, it's not only a sleeping mechanism. They develop the, um, some of the bone structure. They also, um, develop sperm and eggs or the initial response to that. Um, also, um, it's also a key if you fed them the diet properly. And gotcha. after brumation, it usually goes into, into waking up and breeding. During that time, I separate males from females. In nature, um, males are usually up first because they need to build strength for the, for the mating and, and also for competitor and displaying and then stuff like that. So in the first four or six weeks, I have them separated. Are, are they normally kept in colonies? Um, you can keep them. It's the only species you can, um, which is from scientific research, um, where males are not aggressive against each other. So um, it usually helps if you have more males because then there is uh, something like a competition, mm. and the dominant male gets reproduced. And in terms of breeding, I have to switch out males because um, I want to have a stable bloodline over the over the years. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And then incubation, I'm sure, is pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, for desert species, you usually go between 26 and 28 degrees Celsius. For the Mexican or the highland species, you usually go um, for the egg-laying species because we have live bearers as well. As well. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. You usually go with 25 degrees. So um, the time I had the Mexican species, um, I had Asian obicolare. One of them is a life bearer. One of them is eggling. I usually incubated them between 25 to 26 degrees with success. Gotcha. And then how about the baby rearing? I imagine, mm -hmm. do they take the ants right away? Is there any issues with that? Um, smaller ant species, they take as well. The problem with um, with rearing of hatchlings is they don't have those um, defense mechanisms. Uh, um, like like the adults, and then they also have a really high need of humidity, because in the wild they um, they hatch out of a burrow with almost ninety to one hundred per, uh, percent humidity, and the first um, instinct is everyone wants to eat me, so they hide between grasses, and they usually find in the first weeks termites and small ant species, and until um, a month or two when they are a little bit bigger, then they go. Also on harvest ants, um, and a hatchling can feed on harvest ants because um, a hatchling is almost the size of a harvest ant, depending on the species. Really? So that's yeah. me. I didn't realize how small they were, but also how big harvest ants are. They can fit on a penny if they hatch. Wow! <laughs> oh my they god! As, um, I had um, I bred a, a species um, which is the round tail hot lizard. It's one of the smaller species. Um, if you're familiar with Tic Tac candies, the eggs are that size. Are you serious? I was scared to dig them out. <laughs> I was I was there with a little scoop and and, and almost screaming because wow. I don't wanted them. It's they are they are simulating in the wild. Those species are simulating little rocks. They call themselves up and also mimic a little bit of the color like chameleons, and you can find them because wow. they look like a little rock. That's amazing. That that definitely adds a challenge. I mean, if they're that small coming out of the egg, then you know it's a whole other ball of wax as far as feeding and just keeping them in something that they're not going to get out of and and maintaining proper yeah. humidity and and climate. I usually go with with um, with concrete misting, uh, mixing tops because they're a little bit high high on humidity, and then I put it on with with live grass and and straw and cork bark, and I spray them in the first in the first few weeks. I spray them more frequently. And then after the third or um, second or third chat, they usually have a more thicker outer layer and bury themselves a little bit more so they can cover with, with substrate, which also protects a little bit more from, from radiation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So uh, anybody listening will know, can understand, A, how brilliant you are. It's incredible, all the work that you've done and, and all the research that you've done and how all, you know keeping that all in your head. But also the dedication that you have for something like this is, is pretty outstanding. So I'm curious, what's motivating you to, A, work with such a complex species or group of species, and then B, why are you so 
like that, that need to keep that wild experience authentic to the animal where does that come from for you i always admired um people trying to replicate um natural environments i first got introduced them with, with the fish keeping i was surrounded by fish keepers some of them were keeping a lot of cool species in natural environments i always had that picture in mind i want to see the animal in in a lifelike environment from um, taken out from from nature um i also got a lot of backlash back then also my foster parents got a lot of backlash why they were allowing me to keep such a highly specialized species and and do me as i wish but i already had four years experience and i did well with fish so there were no doubt i did good mm. um on um, over the years with introducing a facebook and social media and working at the pet shop i got to introduce the other side of the extreme with really bad keepers bad advice um keeping plushed animals under a heat lamp and carpet and free roaming animals with dogs and which um strengthened that resolve more uh, more strengthened that resolve that i also that i want to keep or act as a role model with this species um in a nature-like environment also some sorts to counteract like substrate is bad wood is bad and everything from outside is bad and cause impaction which we all know is to improper husbandry and um i also think if you keep an species like that that's so misunderstood and over decades were um forced to die because people think and as it from the pharmacy is the way and also companies putting out um, minerals uh, mineral powders with ant acid mm -hmm. which is a pretty renowned company that does does a lot of good food for other reptiles but i know the dark number of horned lizards that died in the process of testing this which is also something that made me furious is there any success with that supplement no, at absolutely all? not um it's because of the um, the rumor of the antacid to to get back to the that and um, um, thing it was um, it's some sort of needed but also not. Um, Horn lizards have the a biochemical process functionality of a called um, catalytic hydrolysis. Under extreme circumstances, they can use antacid to break down moisture from minerals um, and then um, retire the minerals through uh, through an organ. For, for the nostrils and use the moisture. But in captivity, where water is pl plenty, you don't need that functionality in proper care. The rumors spread it, and people um, like urban legends are, with other reptiles as well, um, spread it around, and it was so manifested. But we also had this genius man in Switzerland already producing hatchlings for 30 years. Yeah. And nobody told me. And this urban legend still persists even in, in well-known YouTubers um, 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 feature on these lizards. And I think it's my responsibility as a keeper of a keeper and actual breeder because I, uh, I don't want to introduce this breeder. I'm more a conservative, um, more a natural uh, um, keeper that wants to preserve the animal. I think it's a very responsibility if you work with such a highly um, special species and have success with it to release that information so that conservation um, environments like Fort Worth Zoo, Tinker Air Force Base, um, on Lizard Conservation Foundation can access those information to um, stabilize or reintroduce um, wild populations. So if I have the opportunity to go into the wild, I actually can see horn lizards in the wild. Yeah. That, that I think that's a great answer. I mean, like like you said, you you want to be the, the 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 source of the information for the these yeah. animals, and you know you're probably one of the if not the most experienced person in the world, almost working with these animals in captivity, considering how long you've done it for and how how few people actually do it. It's it's such a bad thing in herpeticulture for these little myths to to just continue on, and then you have people 
who actually don't work with the species who are just saying that because they heard somebody else say that. And then, you know, it just continues to to develop where someone like yourself who actually works with them. And I'm sure the the gentleman in Switzerland as well is not using, you know, magic dust to get these things to to feed. You're actually just doing the work of collecting ants and feeding ants and knowing that that is what works. Yeah, and from him and from his research and also from um, Wetsi Sherbrooke, which in the United States is one of the top four men in, in terms of horned lizards, their research helped me a lot because I only have the experience of keeping them inside, but I also can use that experience to give them feedback if they are in need right. um, of, of reproducing them in the wild or, or on, under, under um, closed uh, circumstances. And I think um, keeping... This kind of species also helps um, other help, um, other people in the reptile hobby to overthink their keeping a little bit, and also helps people um, who actually have and, and there are a lot of people who keep on lizards to um, rethink their husbandry because that's because that's what I do every day. Every day I sit here and 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 think what can I do better. I go to research what can I develop and 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 develop from from there because for me the animal comes first and that's something my wife um also knows if my animals are not in good shape i'm also i'm also not in good shape because Mm -hmm. i always think okay what can i do what i did wrong or what can i do better yeah yeah and and i think there's a tendency for humans just in general to be fascinating and fascinated in something and then learn that there's an element to that thing that is challenging. And then the first thing we often do is, okay, how do we get around that challenge? And so you have people that really want to keep a horned lizard and instead of figuring out, okay, how do we raise an ants and feed ants? They go, what's the next easiest thing I can do that's not feeding ants? And it's just a terrible, it's a terrible solution. Yeah, exactly. And then I don't understand people that are willingly going through such high efforts just to just to avoid going out and 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 most people's having success with um, horned lizards are also having euromastics because they are forced to go out to get food so it's um like Hamel Hamasi he also um keeps horned lizards because he has to go out and and collect food for his euromastics so it's it's just a, a step on on the right or on the left to get ants yeah and now what about just you know, you are breeding them and uh, mm-hmm. pursue, I'm not sure, are you selling them to people or, or how, how do you take that responsibility? Because you are bringing in pretty complicated animals into the yeah. herpetoculture community. How do you process that? I usually go with uh, a short interview. I'm, I'm not really into selling them. I don't want to put a value on, on those animals. And since they are not getting imported and and some breeders are trying to capitalize on them the prices are pretty high for example um i don't like i've talked about money over for my um texas horn lizards i had to sell my um DLS, uh, dlsr with a couple of lenses to get them it was a one-time deal it was a random clutch the female died from the keeper and uh, it was a now or nothing so you situation. sold your camera to, to get them yeah to get them wow and for me, it's more like I want to trade with other keepers. I want to share experience. I want to um, get a stable population so I can long term also have my little studies. I want to make nothing that harms the animal, but I also, I also want to get more into the substrate uh, camouflage thing and introduce them to different colors of substrate and, uh, and, and want to um, challenge them to cover themselves a little bit more with that over time yeah. um and also how they respond to different kinds of ants introduced but i my long-term goal is to have a stable population of horned lizards i am um, at that time because of limited space i only have two species i want to get three more back and stop there yeah because well, you don't um, see yourself getting tired of working with this no this genus no it's the only genus I keep and I want to keep. Um, yeah. Since I was the 10 year old kid, um, it was more, I, I was more feeling bad for the other species I had to keep for my work because I was absolutely not interested in them. It was more like a nuisance to me, but I kept them as bad as, as I could. And, and when they were um, catching up with health, 
I uh, got them back to the store and we sold them to good homes. But for me, it was always and will be always horned lizards. Yeah. Well, I think just this conversation in general leaves a good template for people, whether they want to get into keeping horned lizards mm-hmm. or anything else that's complicated to, to see like how deep you can go. And there's really no, there's no bottom to how far you can take a species as yeah. far as trying to replicate nature in, in a captive, captive setting. Yeah, absolutely. We we just covered the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, it just continues this to is, go. But yeah, absolutely. I can go all day. But I think for most people, if they look at, for example, my 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 pictures on Instagram, I always put in a little anecdote of of information on there because I want I don't want to put out a, a cute picture of my animal. I want to educate people. Mm-hmm. Educate is educating is such a bad word. I want to give out information. On yeah. these lizards. Well, and you just wrote an article for Exotic Keeper magazine yeah. as well, which is you know a pretty thorough article that goes into a lot of the base care and including ants and, and whatnot. And I think that if anyone's interested in the species on a deeper level, that's a great place to start as well. Yeah, two more are coming. Oh, you have two more articles coming. I, I sent uh, Tom. I sent Thomas um, two more, and already working on three more. Okay, awesome. So those will be a seri- it'll just continue to c- carry yeah. on with the series. I will carry on on with every species. I I have um, pictures or stuff like that. I have information from um, for Texas on lizards. It will take a while. They are pretty young, but um, since two thousand uh, fifteen, I haven't um, uh, published something. So there's a lot to keep up, and yeah, I've yeah. bought with social media and and stuff like that. It's now or never. Totally. Yeah, completely. And now you also have a YouTube channel. There's just a couple of videos on there. Is there yeah. plans in the future to, to expand that? Uh, I I want to expand. I already had this pretty successful YouTube channel with um, with a model making. Uh, I was working up, I was working with us as authors at the time. So I was a little bit tired on YouTube and the stuff like that. But I um, with the new enclosures, I want to cover that more with Raptor Room and stuff because those new enclosures are the closest I can get to replicate um, actual the desert. Um, with my standard 4 by 2 by 2s I have um, standing around, it's not suitable. And I also don't recommend that for, for home lizard keepers. Sure. So you'll wait until you're, you're very comfortable yeah. with the setup to share. Exactly. I want to get, I want to uh, be seen as as the optimal setup or a role model, more yeah. like that. I I have a um, I think I have the responsibility um, as a foreman for optimal keeping, because the the species is also protected, and if we are not putting out information that they can kept, be kept of bread or, or help people um, actually achieving those. I think um, sooner or later, species will die out in captivity. Yeah, yeah. No, those are great points. Well, Benjamin, you are a fascinating individual. It's it, I can't Thanks. believe we've only been talking for 70 minutes because you're so precise with how you speak that you just pack so much information into every sentence that it, it's just amazing. Is there anything that we didn't mention today that you wanted to cover before we wrap up? Um, hmm. There's a lot, but I guess we should make another episode some some way around yeah 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 we'll definitely have you back on because there's so much yeah i think this is a good like you said we're kind of just scratching the surface here getting into you know what you do and then you know as your projects evolve i would love to have you back on after you've reestablished those new new enclosures because that's Mm -hmm. the sort of thing that easily translates to other species as well and people can pull from whatever they're working with and learn from that you know it it, it's one of those things that just has a more of a general base that can be helpful for people absolutely I also want to inspire other keepers for for similar species or similar environments to to level up their husbandry because in a more naturalistic setup you can you can see so much potential the animal has and it's so mentally uh, um, challenged to actually live in that environment with minimal interaction that yeah. it's, it's it's a breeze to to watch. Do you have plans for how to observe your animals with minimal interaction? Yeah, I have um, security cameras that I will place on that. And I can also observe them with spot cleaning. I have to go every day and then scoot yeah. out the fecals and while spraying until I install a mist system. Um, but for example, Texas on lizards, they don't like me really much besides that one animal. They had from the previous keeper a pretty deep trauma from grab being grabbed from above. Gotcha. So um, a couple of days ago, put in bunch more grasses so now they are a little bit a little bit more out but 
I want the species to feel secure. It's it's nothing. Um, no one is helped if the species is scared of you. Um, I want to have them um, um, feel as much secure as possible in a closed environment without seeing me all the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's. I think that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Can you let everybody know where your Instagram page and YouTube uh, page is, the name of it, just so they can find you? Um, you can find me on Instagram. It's called at Dragantas Dragons, also throughout Facebook and YouTube. YouTube will be elevated a little bit more on, on, on in a couple of weeks, I guess, if I have to budget. Um but I'm most um, most active on Instagram, where I put my pictures in and my ideas. And also, um, feel free to look under every caption of a picture. There, you might find uh, an anecdote of um, of information there. Awesome. Well, Benjamin, again, like I said, you're a fascinating person. You're you're brilliant, and you're really a, a good an incredible role model for herpeticulture that this is an, you. Uh, it's it, you you make it uh, hard standards for people to live up to which is amazing so thank you so much for being on the podcast and thank you for doing all the work you're doing and we'll 100 percent have you back on again once you've done a little more work in that room thanks for having me yeah it was a pleasure to to meeting you actually <laughs> was looking forward to it all right that is the end of that episode benjamin thank you so much for jumping on the podcast and doing all the work that you do it is as, as i said to the intro you are a uh, gold standing member of the herpeticulture community because of how thorough you are and how just brilliant you are and I, I and i know the listeners will think the same way so listeners if you enjoy this episode make sure you let us know in either the youtube comments or on spotify if you do have any questions for benjamin you can always reach out to him on instagram or also just put them in the comments on youtube as well because we will definitely do another one in the future i, I absolutely want to follow up with with benjamin once he has his new kind of setups created I, I cannot wait to see that and hear how effective they are and so we will do another episode in the future for sure so if you do have any questions for him between now and then make sure you let me know so we can cover that in the future if If you enjoyed the episode and want to share it, that goes a long way to help others learn about the show. So you can do that on Instagram or Facebook. If you would like to support us on Patreon, you can do that at patreon.com slash animals at home. I have to thank, we've had a ton of new patrons sign up recently and it has just been so helpful for me to continue the show, to you know continue to run the show. And I'm so grateful for that. So thank you so much. If you would like to check out the show's sponsor, Custom Reptile Habitats, you can do that at the YouTube description or in the YouTube description, there's an affiliate link and you can also find that same link in the show notes. If you do make a purchase using that link, a commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you and that helps support the show as well. Until the next episode, I will catch you later.